Good evening, everyone, and welcome to World Architecture Day. One would hope that there are multiple events occurring exactly like this around um, the country, and uh, one would hope certainly around the world. Um, thank you also to Ewan and Fleur and the Unlimited team um, for inviting us along this evening. Um, I would like to just begin very briefly by talking about the overarching thematic of this evening's discussion, which relates really to this notion of cities and how cities might actually begin to uh, provide more than they currently do in the rapid expansion of the Asian Pacific. And I've asked our panelists this evening to really try to speculate about what they think there is embedded in the potential of the city as an organizing device, not only for where people might live, but also where they might work, where they might play, where they might actually come to cultural events such as this. And I suppose one of the key issues which is behind this is how architecture might begin to actually be provocative, how architecture might actually begin to do good, how architecture might actually provide better places, and really what the role of the architect might be in the ever-expanding, ever-evolving design, conception, and construction of our cities. I would like to begin this evening uh, by introducing Professor C.J. Lim. Uh, Philip's already spoken very briefly. Thank you about, about C.J.'s bio. Um, one particular element of CJ's uh, production is an incredible, uh, unbelievably prolific set of documents that have been released over the last sort of five years. These small books that have now grown into large books, which have really sought to try and embed and, and, and unpack the ideas about how a different sort of architecture might be derived from thinking about green issues or thinking about sustainability in quite a different and complex manner. He's also giving a lecture later on this week and running a masterclass which hopefully will provoke um, 32 hours of non-stop um, student fun and activity. Um, CJ, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ewan, Fleur, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight, and, I'll, and the team has been absolutely amazing. I think, yep, I think, Martin, you have done my introduction already. I'll just hit the road running. Tonight is this going to be a teaser of what I'll be talking about on Thursday, so, which is my keynote uh, lecture. I hope most of you could come. Uh, otherwise, please join us in the symposium tomorrow, which I will also be speaking. Um, as Martin said, my interest in the built environment has grown over the years from tiny designs of tiny buildings to, in recent years, to enormous cities um, of sort of eight, nine kilometers squares, even 10 kilometers squares in South China, mainly. Um, through the invitation of the Chinese government. But I'll come back to the Chinese government a bit later. When Martin asked me to participate in tonight's talk, he said, why don't you talk about and speculate about what will happen with the expansion of the population? According to statistics that's been released, the population will really increase significantly. And on the other hand, food production will shrink. Uh, by very, very shocking numbers. There has been a lot of uh, drought in recent years, and places like North Korea, Russia, and so forth, and have really banned their wheat and grain export. And there has been reported that um, there's a billion people around the world that is undernourished and starving. And that's shocking statistics. And it's really, really sad that in this day and age, there will be people who goes without having a meal. And I think with the lack of food security, it will also result in lack of stability in certain countries. And that's, again, 
a big, big problem for all of us, not just the countries which are uh, affected, but for all those who are observing from the side as well. So, my uh, notion is that if Adam and Eve had everything in the Garden of Eden, why can't we have the same privilege? Why can't we have food at our doorstep rather than having to import them from far away? I'm based in London. Uh, we import 90% of our food from Europe from, and the rest of the world. Um, during my research before coming to Australia, um, I found statistics that even in Australia last year, for the first time, Australia has imported more food than exporting it, which I think should set most of you uh, with big question marks. What should be done? What I proposed to the Chinese government was that of this notion of the smart city. The smart city integrates the cultivated land with the urban condition. It actually forms symbiosis uh, between nature and the built form. And I think also our attitudes must change. Our attitudes must change that the notion of wealth must include other things like fresh air, green space, nutrition, and social cohesion, things that we take for granted but are absolutely vital if we want to have continue a civilized life in the 21st century. And if there's a civilized legacy to be left to generations after us. This is what I see every, on every project when I go to China. Beautiful, fertile land that produce a lot of food for South China, China itself, Hong Kong, and Macau. And the government there are very, very happy to get rid of it, to replace it with new cities. Cities that are concerned predominantly with renewable energies, but food is never part of the equation. So my suggestion has been about in incorporating urban farming into new cities. Urban farming is not new. This is a picture outside the Reichstag in Berlin where um, the Berliners were planting potatoes and cabbages outside the building. And the same happened in America and also in England where we planted potatoes in High Park. What we really want is to empower a whole generation of farming communities urban farmers, eco-warriors in the urban context. I think they would be the ones who will be saving the rest of us who are lazy uh, from destruction. I'll run through very quickly a series of imagery, vision, provocative images to maybe tease you to come to my proper lecture on Thursday. Uh, this project in South China, in Guangming, uh, the park being the center of food production, from fruits to vegetables. Um, this is a project in Chicago on Lake Michigan, where um, boats are the allotments for, for this food production site. A recent project we finished last week in Penang, uh, creating a series of microclimate hubs uh, covered with urban agriculture and housing. A similar mixed-use development in South China. A interesting system that has a symbiotic relationship between uh, farming and flooding, just like the now. A project in South Korea in Copenhagen, a regeneration of the old docks. South Korea again, the idea of stacking farming. This was the main project that we did for the Chinese government a few years ago, where we had this conversation and said, 
they wanted us to get rid of all the farming community. And we said, if we can provide you with all the facilities that you require, can we keep the farming community? And they say, yes, that was the beginning of this whole conversation about the smart city, which is a vision, a manifesto, and as much a provocation, so that we can all really sit back and think very carefully how planning legislations and food policies could come together and work for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. I hope that was enough of a tease. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Timothy Hill. Um, many of you will know Timothy, and particularly um, as the architect, um, along uh, with Brian Hill, of this building. Um, Brian Donovan, sorry. Um, he's a partner and director of Donovan Hill, a, a fantastic practice in Australian terms, and one of the very few Australian architects who have been able to transform from producing excellent houses into producing excellent large buildings, which is a very rare feat for our architects. Um, Timothy is also incredibly passionate about Brisbane and incredibly passionate about the expansion of Brisbane and, and the manner in which Brisbane might begin to grow appropriately. Timothy. Thank you, Martin, for these kind words. And thank you, Dr. Lim, for these beautiful imaginings about how the city can be. And it's my commitment now, now to be extremely dull by comparison. Because I think it's an, it's an appropriate thing for architects to be. Because at the times when architects have been entrusted with having the visions for society, they have perhaps not been the best of times. And that what might be the best thing that can happen to cities, since they are a kind of triangle where capital and transport and housing kind of compete for how the place is going to be occupied, that if more about what it is that architects know, which is really often about some quite rigorous thinking and how to pick a good ideology from a bad one, if that could be shared amongst more people, rather than rely on ideas where architects have any influence in their system, I think we may have some more success. There's a slide. Now, am I in, who's in, there's someone in charge of slides. This is just so we can, we can get our bearings. Uh, we can, the experts among us, among us can even tell in that photo where we're, we are right now. The way that the city in Brisbane comes about is very similar to many in Asia because it's uh, essentially a commercially driven enterprise. It's not that we're in the growing business, it's just that growing, uh, growth is our business. And I think what we should do is not over-philosophize about how we could influence that, but try and use our usual architectural brain to have a think about how we could adjust that, knowing that cities like this and many other phenomena of economies come into existence by people... Uh, shifting levers, arranging bits of taxation, orchestrating little pieces of benefit in essentially designing how economies work. Surely there's a way that we could design how the cities and how the people who are really operative, which is not architects, how it is that they might be, in a sense, brought to a table where we could all uh, feel a bit more satisfied. The, the, the shift in how these arrangements in history is interesting. It's the, it's the moment where... If I had a slide of Bath in England with the beautiful crescents, the existing infrastructure of the uh, baths, its connection to a rail system that made it accessible, that in fact it's, it's, that was one of the moments, perhaps like the 19th century development of Melbourne, where the people who spent the money, people who organised the transport, and the people who did the housing all more or less agreed about what should happen. But we now function in a time when there's profound disagreement between these groups about what a city is. 
And I don't think we need vision in order to have some recon reconciliation amongst those groups. I think we could just acknowledge some conventions. Well, it's an overexcitable machine. Here I am trying to be dull in the slides. Is there someone else in charge who could just move just the one slide? I mean, look, there's a million people going, having a nice afternoon in Beijing, just for... Which is something that, that is extremely human and that, which is fair to say that, all, that a lot of these people are enjoying. And I think it's that simplicity of convention that you can apply to lots of things. So, for instance, I mean, it's, it's vastly over-polarising, but it's possible to say that when we go travelling or when we go living, it's usually the old part of the city that's better to be in than the new part. We can unpick why that's the case. Uh, often it's something as banal as the fact that there's hardly any driveways and it's unbearably difficult to park your car, but it ends up making a nice place. Usually cities where the transport is really working so that you can get around in the city are better than cities where the transport doesn't work. Cities that rely on housing, being fairly supportive of the idea of the, the streetscape and the way the city works, rather than housing having to be heroic projects themselves that leaves the streets as residue, are usually better. So in sorting out, therefore, about how this arrangement of um, capital might be adjusted, I've got some kind of provocative suggestions, I hope, because the the promise was for provo provocation, and I'm gearing not to provoke you with an ideas about what an architect could do or imagine, but simply some recognition. So we have in China something bigish here, bigish and newish, and uh, the the idea, for instance, about uh, what it is that's between these buildings and, the, and, and that might make the city would be something that, just as it is in Brisbane, is extremely difficult to actually orchestrate because it's not clear who's in charge of it, and it's not clear where the return is going to be delivered on making those, on making those places. So what we therefore see in our context is essentially the same diagram where we had a flash of the, the lady pointing on the billboard and the rubble on the ground, so that we end up with places that I call have, or I have a kind of satisfy a functional success in terms of Anglo-Saxon objectionism, where that means that you set out what it is that you would like to happen in the city, and you can object to that or not, which is an extremely defensive way of thinking about doing something wonderful and lovely for people. Because to propose things and to tolerate objections about it and to focus all of your resources on people objecting to it produces two things. One is we end up with strategic plans that say, for instance, that, and I've, we've read them, they exist in this city as they do in many others, that there should be greening in the streets and for state sustainability bicycles should be welcome and there should be public transport systems and there should be high density. So all of these things are, are demonstrated in, in numerous ways, but they're geared and phrased so that they can't be objected to. So to imagine it in reverse, if you took all of the bureaucrats who argue with each other using the adversarial English system for, say, two years for a development, and, and all of their anxiety and all of their arguing goes into what their interpretation of what someone has drawn might be like. And then eventually some arrangement is made and the thing is built, and then after it's built, the process ceases. So, for instance, if you took all of those bureaucrats and got them to measure what actually worked in the city rather than mounting defensive arguments against it, and you approved every project within three days with extremely onerous provisions that if it wasn't any good, that it was going to be torn down, then if you had a way of setting up target buildings by using publicly bond-raised money, then you could say, well, here's the suite of exemplary buildings, and you better match the standard or it's going to get chopped off which is, in, in, in some respects, how, how Singapore works. So that in this uh, chopping and changing, and it's, it's an imagining of not a new suite of ideas, but 
an alternate and more reasonable way of actually making places. Because to fight either with a builder or to fight with a town planner or to fight with a politician seems hardly like the kind of gentleness that would accompany a beautiful place. So that to explain more anecdotally perhaps, we have prepared a set of images previously with um, Wilson Architects where we took the setting that we're in and we made a suggestion of its alternative where there was, in a sense, a vision that favoured people and then challenged the idea of who was doing the envisaging. So, for instance, I'm one of the architects involved in this scheme and I, I think we should all be very upfront and be reminded how little impact architects have. So, for instance, you know, good or bad, this is not, for instance, an architect's idea of how this place should be. So we went to the public partly to demonstrate whether it was possible to do some research and partly to experiment with the idea that if you structure the question correctly, then there's a way of engaging with people, which means you don't ask them, do you like the look of this? You say, do you think it's a good idea at the cultural centre that instead of it being cultural because it's severe, clean and detached, is this alternative that it's actually part of the life of the city? I'm not too good at this. It's part of the life of the city, and in fact, uh, we look evidentially at the model that cultural precincts, which, if we, again, if we just refer to convention, have hardly any evidential success in low-density cities like Brisbane, but we're actually to plough in a whole lot more people, which meant that the seven restaurants that we have in this district, for instance, could be full. Then this would be an ideologically immensely different idea, but it's quite rigorously, ordinarily argued, conventional proposition. And so in, maybe it's just up to architects to make some of those simple arguments and find out ways to make them. So for here, for instance, uh, we have what is a very decent service road. And because it's a service road, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of the people who did have the vision. And that was the vision that came about. And that's where we need to change how convention is communicated. So that, for instance, if you took the bad thing, which is where the service road is thought of not just as a service road for a gallery, but a service road for lots of things, and that because there's some beautiful things about, you should put some more beautiful things about, then it's interesting that when we measured public responses to these suggestions, uh, they were extraordinarily popular, so that they were in fact absolutely opposite to the people who, who did the saying of what they were convinced it was that people want. So when we have this schism, we need some ways. This, of course, uh, is a way of obt obtaining views to the city. It's very important to have views. They sell apartments. And then, for instance, you could also occupy that view, uh, although there's extraordinary dangers there with children bumping into inflatable animals. And I can imagine that there would be light bulbs ruined by the water. Uh, a nice bit of decent swept plaza, which is like uh, obviously this kind of obscenity that favours children and keeps people in the shade is uncalled for. And that a building that's on the river uh, ought to just be decently that. And to think that it might have a whole lot of activities that went with it is really a bit beyond the pale. And that um, as part of being that river city, uh, one of the ways, again, that it establishes how beautiful the river is is to not put too much stuff on it. Because if you did, then all the people who are in the stuff would end up on the river and that would be untidy. <laughs> and the buildings ought to be uh, neatly detached and when they involve things, they should be looked at and under no circumstances should they be participated in or thought of that culture might actually have that kind of reach or that uh, lawns for people uh, to uh, picnic upon, should they so choose, again with views, uh, are best left uh, undisturbed or uh, quite uh, threateningly, I guess, irrespective of whether we turn our light bulbs off or not, the water is rising, and uh, presumably that becomes another town planning concern that's managed at the time. 
so that we have again the the notion here that we've got something that's that's suspended so that people don't have to walk on the on the streets which at the time and in the place was a vision that was subscribed to even though the convention has difficulty supporting it and it was amazing that when we put to the population who we met here at the site and explained the theory behind these drawings, the tremendous subscription in the 80% type league that they had to all of these images. So they are, the people themselves are ready for urban farming if we just did a little bit of research. So I think it's perhaps, we should be careful what an architect suggests. So I will just quickly outline a couple of measures that if you redesign the system, rather than advocate, uh, we, we might work with. For instance, 40% of any Australian building produced in the commercial sphere is gone in tax. So that if you wanted to make cheaper housing for people, or if you wanted to actually change the quality of buildings, if you redirected the way the tax works, instead of relying on the building industry to raise revenue, you would have a different environment. Uh, if you shifted the road rights, so no one has a right to drive on the road, but everyone has a right to use public transport and you have to buy tickets to use cars. Uh, we could run a scheme surplus where if we've got an enormous amount of capacity that sits picking through uh, planning applications and so forth, if we just shifted all of those wages onto producing schemes so there were vastly more schemes than there were available building opportunities in the city, so people could actually choose and debate about things before they happened, rather than consider the circumstantial threats of what might happen, uh, we would have a different type of place. Uh, we could offer, I think this is a real uh, money spinner, this one, where you actually can't become a financier and you cannot become a real estate agent unless you've passed with a quite a decent mark first year architecture. <laughs> So that, in fact, you've actually got to learn that the power group who run the built environment, if they actually had some knowledge about what it was that they were commissioning, then maybe that's, that is something that is so ordinary that it might make a difference. In other words, I'm saying it's perhaps not what architects have to say, but who it is that they could say it to so that more people can do that talking. Thank you.